Cicerone. Hello and welcome to Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast, a podcast to inspire you about outdoor travel and activities in the UK and across the world. I'm Hannah and you can email me with your thoughts or your questions on live at cicerone.co.uk. So today I'm here with Cicerone author John Hayes, who was lucky enough to retire in his mid-50s and has been travelling pretty much ever since, doing lots and lots of walking and cycling around the entire world. Pertinent to this conversation, though, is his latest guidebook to the Ruta Via de la Plata, which goes through Western Spain. Cicerone did have a a cycle touring live event and John Hayes was one of the guests on there. So if you haven't watched that yet, that would be worth catching up on. And you can catch that on YouTube or on Facebook or on the Cicerone website. And we discussed all sorts of helpful information, but some top tips about cycling, which was really helpful. But we thought it was still worth having a podcast episode, especially on the route of Villa de la Plata, because it is just such an interesting route. So, John, can you just explain a bit more about where the route of Via de la Plata goes and the variant ending? Okay, well, the the original uh, route is an ancient Roman route to the north of where my route starts and goes all the way uh, over the Cantabrian Mountains. And that original Roman route was then uh, picked up uh, in the Middle Ages as a, as a Camino, as a, as a route pilgrims heading from the south of Spain up to Santiago. So what my route does is follow the original route of Via de la Plata uh, along its Roman route and then joins another, uh, which is uh, a Camino, and then uh, either continues along the original route to Gijon or turns left and follows the, uh, the, the pilgrimage option and heads to Santiago del Compostela. What does Ruta Via de la Plata mean? Well, a slightly controversial. Uh, my understanding is a key, it obviously means root, but the, there's some con- controversy about the word La Plata. My reading and the sources I've got I believe it comes from the, the Arab for paving. So it was a, a, a paved Roman route, and the, the Arabic for paving is, is Plata. A lot of people interpreted as silver. So you'll see both, uh, and obviously it was an important silver route, particularly after the conquest of Latin America, because all the silver came in through Seville and up up along the cities along the route of of a route of de la Plata. I tend to think it's the the Roman derivation and it's the Arabic word for for paving rather than the, the silver route. If it's from the word for paving, does that mean that it's a fully paved cycle tour? No, it's quite interesting. I mean, there are bits along the route. You'll go over Roman bridges, Merida on the uh, third day. Um, you'll go across the, the longest Roman bridge uh, still existing in Europe. And you'll you'll come across Roman bridges all over the place. And one stretch, a beautiful stretch, uh, you're, there's, there's Roman milestone markers uh, every mile, uh, which uh, you can prop your bike up against and have a great picture. Uh, but there, there's, I think it was about eight or nine of them are still in place. But generally speaking, the view is that when the Romans had it, it was better looked after than it is today. It follows a, a major transport route. If you're off-road, the Camino follows mainly farm tracks and, 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 and the like, rarely anything more difficult than a farm track. But the road, which runs along the same transport corridor, which is, I guess, the same sort of standard as, a, as an A road in, in the UK, is obviously perfectly paved, and it's called the Ruta Vida de Plata, the actual, actual road. What's happened in Spain is because over the last... I guess 20 years or so, they've, they've spent so much money building new motorways. The, there's a motorway route which uh, also runs along the same transport corridor. And that's taken all of the traffic of what was the A road. It's called the N525. And it's perfectly empty, wonderfully graded, and very, very easy to follow if you want to, if you want to follow it on a road bike. That bit in particular sounds nice and fast. Yes, yes. So you could do, if you, I mean, obviously it's a question of your own personal preference, but you, it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of how how fast you want to get from A to B. Uh, 
it's not it's not uh, a really difficult route uh, in terms of massive gradients or or, or difficult climbs. And if if you wanted, and I know lots of road cyclists like that, like the massive gradients and difficult climbs. But you you you, you certainly it, it isn't that challenging. Uh, and if you wanted to go quickly, um, you could you could cut the uh, itinerary down. Uh, my itinerary down by quite a lot. Okay, so how long how long do you expect it should take people? Well, depending on the variant. So from Seville to Gijon is fourteen days. I broke it down into fourteen stages. But if you take the, the variant, you have to add another two days. Um, albeit that if you um, if you're really reasonably fit and you uh, stick to the road. You could definitely do it probably in 12 days and in, in, and in for the uh, Gijon route and in 14 days for the Santiago del Compostela route. It's, it's not, you could do that without really breaking sweat, I would say. Well, depending on the time of year. It, depending on the time of year, yes. <laughs> it, yes. The big issue, I'd say, is, is um, cycling in, in August and uh, early September could be, uh, July, August and September could be a bit hot. But even then, on a bike, um, you've, you you create a bit of a breeze, I think. So you, it's, it's not it's not as bad as perhaps not as bad as walking actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting point. Um, so does your guidebook provide an entire off road route and an entire road route? It does. The route from Seville to Gijon um, is supported by uh, an association of local authorities who are a longer route. Um, they, they, they try to promote it and get as many people to use it to uh, bring tourists into the area. And they've defined two different routes. They've defined the road route and the off-road route. The, uh, the off-road route basically follows uh, the Camino, uh, albeit it goes to Gijon. There is also a Camino heading south from Gijon to, uh, to Lyon. So you can follow, you're, you're still following a, a, a Camino, uh, a footpath style route. Uh, and then the road route follows the, the end roads. Um, what I've done though is, is try and produce the best of both worlds because frankly, uh, I think the, to get the best of it, if you, if you, if you, if you like touring, um, you should do at least some of the off-road route because you, you get more into the countryside. It's absolutely incredibly beautiful. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's quite easy. So, so in, in a way, why wouldn't you? You're following, as I say, you're following sort of agricultural roads, really, roads which uh, vehicles can get down, ag agricultural vehicles in particular. And uh, so it's not inaccessible, but it's, it's, it's probably something you wouldn't want to go along on a really top quality carbon racing bike, but you would be able to go along on a, on, on a standard touring bike uh, or a gravel bike. It's perfect for that. And um, so my preferred approach would be to do as much of the off-road route as possible, but then use the road routes to speed things up if, 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 if you wanted to get somewhere a little bit quicker or to avoid some bits which are a little bit difficult and frankly it's occasionally a bit boring a bit superfluous because they go right next to the road route so um i'm not I'm, personally i'm not a purist in the sense of wanting to always go on the off-road route if it's, it's almost in the sort of along the grass verge of, of, of a nice smooth easy road i'd prefer to go on the road in that case and that's what that's what my uh, guide attempts to do it attempts to give you the best of both worlds, uh, provide you a, a, a sort of a hybrid option between the road route and, and, and the off-road route. The third way. Yeah, it sounds really nice that, that you don't have to make any hard and fast decisions before you go. You can just see how you're feeling or if, you know, if you're a bit tired, maybe you'd want to stick to the road because it's slightly less complicated definitely, for your legs or, or something like that. I quite yeah. like that idea. So, does that mean that each one starts and finishes at the same place with the road and the off-road yes, options? Yes, yes. So the way the guidebook works, it, it's broken down into a series of days uh, and then um, each, each day representing a stage. 
you can imagine there's a lot of discussion about this with Cicero and how to work it all out. And then yeah. within each stage, uh, there are a series of what we call legs. Uh, it might get a bit boring this, but so you can go along <laughs> for about five kilometers along, along a road leg, and then you can join an off-road leg and for the next five. And so at the end of each leg, you, there's a junction between the road and the off-road um, because they're running very close to each other by and large. Um, and recommendations and descriptions about how difficult or how uncomfortable or how wonderful and how unmissable uh, each bit is. And obviously, um, that refers in particular to, to the off-road stretches and uh, saying, don't miss this, you're missing a, a, a cycling day of a lifetime if you do sort of thing. What's the accommodation like along the route? Because it's uh, a Camino, um, you've got a lot of accommodation. And because most people on the Camino are walking, from a cyclist's point of view, the, the accommodation comes thick and fast. Uh, so if, if, you, if you don't want, to, if you want to go further than my stage recommendations or not as far, there's, there's lots and lots of places in between the stage ends. But at the stage ends, you've got, generally speaking, and I, I guess 90% of the ends, you've got a choice between a parador, which in, in, in Spanish terms are, it's a, they're just wonderful places there. Um, the unique Spanish invention from the 1920s went in order to preserve monasteries and castles and, and, and stately homes, which were falling into disrepair. They, uh, the government at the time nationalized them and turned them into, into hotels called paradors. And they're still nationalized, I think. And uh, so these are often palaces, um, and they're quite reasonable. And you can, in UK terms at least, um, about uh, 100, 100 euros a night, and you can stay in a palace. Uh, really, really <laughs> splendid places. Or there's a, a fabulous range of sort of mid-range hotels, um, usually with a restaurant and, and so on and so forth. Or you can go all the, all the way to the other end and stay in, in hostels, auberges, which is a, a traditional accommodation for, for pilgrims. Originally, they were free, but now you, they, they, they charge you. And you, I think that you're talking about 15 euros, that sort of price, if you want to stay in, in one of those. I have to say, when I'm cycling with, with, with my wife, we tend to stay in the more comfortable places. So. <laughs> That's part of the enjoyment as far as we're concerned. Yeah, I'm not sure what it would take for me to get my wife to do one of these cycling routes, but the bare minimum would be a luxury hotel. <laughs> well, I think, honestly, that I don't know anywhere where accommodation is better value than it is in Spain. I don't know anywhere where it's, uh, it's more interesting than it is, is in Spain because, you know, it's such a variety. The Paradors aren't so good in terms of uh, products, I think you could call them. You know, all the stuff you get in the bathroom and all that sort of stuff. There are better places than, than, than the paradox of that. They're a tiny little bit old-fashioned. But in terms of, of just fun and, you know, great big rooms and a wonderful view, views and going up uh, stone staircases to get to your room and all that sort of stuff, they're just amazing. I, I've never heard that before. I've seen that. I've seen the name Parador. And and I didn't realise that they were the historical monument building. Well, I think the one, the Parador in Lyon is is my favourite. When I was last there, it was going through renovation. I'm sure the renovation would have finished. But the first time I stayed there, it was just incredible because although it was a Parador and you, 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 you associate pilgrims with uh, budget accommodation, all the pilgrims were staying there. There were pilgrims. I mean, but one of the nice things about the pilgrimage side of it is... Um, it's a really international thing. So you get people from just about every country in the world doing it because it's such an iconic uh, thing to do. And they all stay in the Parador in Lyon, definitely. And Lyon is a fabulous place to visit in its own right. Yeah, with the cathedral. Have you seen the cathedral? No, I've heard about it. I've heard it's spectacular. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. You have to go in it either early in, in the day or what we, what we call the golden hour from the photographer's point of view, early early morning or late evening. And it, the special thing is the stained glass. It's got so much stained glass. And it's got a really interesting story because um, it was sort of started to fall down and they built it up again in the uh, 
of the 18th century. And it's an amazing feat that they managed to get it to stand up. It's all held up cantilevered wise. And uh, um, it's, it's just a wonderful building. But there are many, many wonderful buildings along the route. I went to uh, La Sagrada Familia a couple of years ago for the very first time. And that day, I must have just been lucky with the time of day that it was, but I remember realising the point of stained glass with all this sunlight flowing through and and the patterns in the air and the, the effect. And it took my breath away. And I remember thinking that all these poor churches in England that I've seen growing up that have stained glass and they just they just don't get the lighting to produce that effect and it yeah it was incredible because you have gray days in, in in england and yes that's right and it's uh, the leon cathedral has such such a quantity of, of stained glass as well it's it's I mean, there's, there's, there's several places along the route which are worth going to in their own right. You wouldn't need to be cycling from place to place. But what makes the route special is that um, there's a whole series of them. You know, you, you, it's like a whole series of weekend trips to the best place you go for a weekend, and you do that every single day. It's, 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 it's amazing. And Leon, I think, is my favourite place, but um, uh, Salamanca is also wonderful, and uh, Merida, which you visit um, on, on day three, is, is is amazing for Roman remains. And of course you start in, in Seville, which makes you wonder why you'd ever leave Seville because it's so nice, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just incredible. If John Hayes has inspired you to want to get a copy of his guidebook to cycling the Ruta Via de la Plata, we're offering 25% discount to listeners of this podcast. If you use the code PLATA25 at the Cicerone checkout, I hope you enjoy exploring the route for yourself. So I had this question prepped as a bit of a, a trick um, because what a lot of listeners don't realise is how long the process is from researching and writing a guidebook to it finally being published. Um, and with COVID in the middle, we had to change some of our publishing schedule. So your book has been brewing for a while, but there's a, a fact that this route goes through eight World Heritage sites. And I wondered if you can reel them off. Yes, here we go. Well, you have to count me down because I'm not sure I'd get them all. Well, I told you it was a bit of a trick because, you know, I'd, it could have been that you've forgotten them and it, no one would hold it against you. Well, obviously, there's, uh, there's World Heritage Sites and there's World Heritage Sites in cities because I'm pretty sure that Sevilla has, has got more than one World Heritage Site. Maybe it's even got three, but I'm not sure if I counted I can't remember how I counted the eight, whether I counted Sevilla as having three or whether I counted the city, but Sevilla certainly got World Heritage Site status. Merida, which you see on the third day, certainly has, albeit that uh, Zafra, which you see on the second, uh, Merida you see on the fourth day, Zafra on the third day. Zafra doesn't have World Heritage Site status, but could well have. It, it, it's absolutely uh, fabulous. You then go to Kakaras, which is where Game of Thrones had this, this a real famous game, Game of Thrones place, which has got World Heritage Site status. You then go to Plasencia, which has got World Heritage Site status, and it's got arguably the second best um, uh, Parador in it. I mean, people argue about which is the best Parador in Spain. The <laughs> oldest Parador in Spain is, uh, is at Santiago they got Compostela, but you can, it's very difficult to get into because it's, um, it, and it's the oldest uh, hotel in the world. But so. In the world? Yes, it's the old, oldest hotel in the world. What are the bathroom products like there? <laughs> I've never stayed there, <laughs> to be honest. Um, <laughs> uh, then, so Plasencia has got World Heritage, Salamanca has got World Heritage, and Salamanca is an amazing city. It's, um, it's a, a university city. Um, it's certainly got one, maybe two. And then you've got Lyon, uh, which has obviously got it. And do you know what? Yes, Oviedo has it. Um, which, so that's, that's going up to, up to Gijon. I don't know if you're counting these. No, sorry. I stopped counting. <laughs> um, Zamora has it, which is actually, I, I, sh I should have mentioned that earlier because you, you get to Zamora before you get to, uh, to Lyon and it's, just beyond Zamora is where the turnoff is. And there's no World Heritage Site then, I don't believe, until you get to Santiago 
del, del Compostela, albeit that um, on the way you stay in uh, Orange, which is a, another very historic place, but I don't, I don't think it's got World Heritage Site status. I think the only one that you've mentioned that maybe isn't on this list is the one that was like Plasenka. Plasencia. Plasencia. I don't think yeah. that that doesn't seem to be on this list. Okay. I so maybe you've one. just, it's got a John Hayes <laughs> heritage status. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Spain is, is quite, you know, because they, 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 they're good at promoting their, uh, their tourism potential, they're quite good at getting world heritage status um, for various things. But, yeah, but it, it definitely deserves it. The nice thing about uh, cycling is you're traveling bigger distances, so you're you're able to stay in in, in, in if you like in constantly nicer, pl- more interesting places. Whereas if you're walking and you're you know you're doing say twenty kilometers a day, inevitably you're you're having to stay in smaller places, particularly in Spain where the distances are quite large. So I I think it's it's definitely a country which lends itself to uh, to cycling because you, you can pack more in in terms of seeing stuff and i my my sort of style of of cycling in spain is very much to get to a place in time to see it and in time to enjoy the place as well enjoy the accommodation enjoy the food um and and be able to uh have enough time to roam around see the see the things have a beer or whatever you you know you like to do and every significant town in Spain has, I, I get my pronunciation wrong, but has a, a town square, Plaza Mayor, and and they're, they're nearly always the same uh, sort of a courtyard, essentially. And they'll all have chairs in them. And by about, uh, I don't know, 7.30 in the evening, that's the time when everyone is sitting there just looking at each other and, and drinking lots of, well, not drinking lots, they don't drink massive quantities in Spain, but just sitting there taking it all in. And that's for me. That's definitely part of the enjoyment of this trip to be able to do that and um, and not uh, not be killing yourself in terms of cycling, but feeling self satisfied enough from your exercise to be able to sit and enjoy yourself and have some nice food and yeah, work up a healthy appetite, but not be too tired. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So some people might regard it as slightly touring, but um, that's my preferred approach and that's what um in in spain in particular and that's what makes this trip particularly nice because it's so rich in terms of things to see and do yeah yeah and and like you said before the flexibility of of it being a pilgrim trail that if you just decide to cut a day short or go a bit further that you have got such good infrastructure um you can you can have that flexibility yeah yeah definitely definitely on the on the the cycling itself, what's the the landscape like, and how how hilly is it? Spain is quite famous for its its flatness and um, and the plateau. So, in in Seville, you're on the on the coastal plain. Uh, so on the first day, you have to climb onto onto the plateau, um, and that's um, so. There's a it's, it's not a steep climb. But you you notice at the end of the day that the, the end of the first day feels like a, it's your first day, and uh, b you've actually done a bit of climbing. You it, you, you, you notice it, but after that there's a, a number of I think it's three passes on the on the main route up to Gijon, but none of them are more than I think two or three hundred meters of climb, and then you have a long slow climb over the Cantabrian mountains. It's very very gentle. Uh, and all because you're 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 hitting the Cantabrian mountains, you're already at, on the on the plateau when you hit the Cantabrian mountains. Um, when you hit it from the south, you then climb up gently, climb up that, and depending on whether you take the road route or the off road route, you then have this huge descent down back onto the coastal plain. So there's a there's a few passes to cross as you go from one river system to the next river system. If you've done something like the coast to coast, for example, in the UK, uh, you'd be disappointed at the absence of, of really big climbs. Well, uh, you might not be. <laughs> <laughs> no, there isn't. There isn't. A, the, the, there aren't the seriously difficult climbs you get on on something like the coast. Well, I think there's only is it one or two big climbs on the coast to coast or the way of the roses. But that climb up into into into, into the Pyrenees is nothing as steep as that. 
So it's, it's, e- it's fairly, it's fairly easy cycling in terms of climbing, depending on whether you take the, the off-road route or the road route. You've got a, a fully metal surface as one option, or you've got basically agricultural style roads and occasionally a little bit of, of, of single track, but always accessible routes on, on the off-road routes as well. And then you've got some really splendid landscapes to go through. Some uh, from from the um, if you're used to the English countryside, a, a completely different countryside in Spain, and in the south in particular, and you you get to experience it in a very very sort of intimate way if you're cycling on the off-road route. There's a there's a a, there's a landscape called the Dehesa, which is a landscape produced by uh, livestock. Uh, wide open livestock farming and it's it's just an amazing landscape so it's, it's landscapes so it's basically meadows with a scattering of evergreen oaks which provide this incredible shade for the for the for the animals it's a, just the most wonderful landscape and if you if you go in the spring april may time it's just an absolute sea of of wildflowers just incredible um, so you're cycling along tracks through this wildflowers, through lots of options for shady oaks, you know, these black pigs and uh, the cattle in the, in the sunshine as well look, look very, very nice. It's a wonderful, a wonderful landscape for cycling through. We, we are running out of time. Um, and one of the things I was going to ask you was about how to get there with your bike. And I know we had quite a lot of discussion about this on our live events so i'm going to skip that for now and just if there's anybody that has got questions about how to get there with their bike jump over onto youtube or get the podcast episode that we made of that live event because there were three cyclists discussing top tips and and options for how to take your bike with you or hire a bike when you get there can you describe in one quick sentence what you love most about the route of via de la plata Right. Um, <laughs> uh, <start> no. <laughs> with, <laughs> all right. Starting in a wonderful place, traveling through some amazing landscape without having to work too hard, finding a great place to stop for a cup of coffee, and then getting to your destination in time for a lovely late lunch. That's 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 the perfect day on on the route to be able to apply. And then spending the evening walking around, touring, and having a beer. And you do that day after day. It's a pretty nice way to spend a couple of weeks. It is. It is an excellent way to spend a couple of weeks. Lovely. Right. Well, thank you very much, John. Thank you. Well, that was great. I hope you enjoyed the latest episode of Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast. I'd love to know what you think or if there's anything you'd like us to cover in future episodes. Please email us on live at cicerone.co.uk or leave a review on your podcast platform. You can follow or subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss new episodes, or you can sign up to our newsletter for all our latest news, events, and guidebooks. Visit cicerone.co.uk for further details. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, please feel free to come and join us on our social media channels. We're on all the main ones as at Cicerone Press, and we also have a Facebook group, Cicerone Connect, where you can meet and chat to other outdoor enthusiasts. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you soon.